so Hollywood loves a villain. I feel that all the narratives that we hear nowadays, whether they're um, in publications or movies or TV shows, always about these doom and gloom dystopian visions of when the robots come to kill us all or when AGI takes over or autonomous killing machines, what happens when sentiment analysis gets into our uh, security cameras and smart cities. And there's two main problems with this kind of thinking. Number one, if all we do is present these dystopian negative visions, it doesn't really get the public on board. And so therefore, they're not going to be able to imagine all the positive uses that all these exponential technologies will have. And number two, don't we have enough problems right now to be solving, rather than all of the hypothetical ones that might never happen, that we're spending all of this time and money and effort on? And we was talking to Pablis earlier this week, and he said to me, those kinds of things, are, it's just like worrying about if Darth Vader and the stormtroopers are going to come into Seattle and take over a Starbucks. We have other things to be worrying about right now. So with that, I'm going to be bringing on stage some people who are helping actually create this future. And we're going to be talking about how to ground ourselves in the future, how to ground ourselves in what is happening right now, but also be thinking about the biggest things that we want to achieve in the future. So we have Pablis Holman, who is uh, an inventor at Intellectual Ventures. We have Mary Lou Jespin, who is a CEO and founder of Open Water. And then we have Neil Jacobstein, who is the chair of the AI and robotics track at SU. So we're going to be talking today about you know, those big lofty ideas we have in the future, but we have to ground them in the very real things that are happening in the present. So as an opening question, what are some of the biggest things that we need to be working on right now that will impact the future if we don't get started? Go for it. <laughs> uh, getting out of the gloom and doom of the last three sessions, I think. Um, <laughs> the nice way to fix it is to invent what's next. And so clearly there's areas that we're all working on to try to make a more exciting future. And that's an intro for you. Uh, <laughs> biggest you problems, ready. what's the question, biggest problems? The things that we should be looking at now before, rather than all of the things no, that we're we should so just off. be looking at how to make the future more awesome than the world is today. Um, I mean, yeah, solve energy, solve water, make a, you know, Jetpacks a little more economical because the one that they're showing here is four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you guys have a list. Education, healthcare, transportation. Oh, and that. Yeah. <laughs> Global warming. Yeah, I think more? that uh, rather than focus on potential risks exclusively, what we really ought to do is focus on the risks that we know we have to solve yeah. and use the technologies that we have to focus on them and use entrepreneurial energy to actually get over the activation energy curve of addressing these problems. And if we don't do that, we won't have an opportunity to live into the kind of future we want. And when we're doing that, we need to be thinking about doing that with uh, ethics and inclusivity at the very core of the foundation of what we're doing. Because if we accidentally bake these biases into the foundation of these ideas we have for the future, they're much harder to go back and you know, control alt delete after they've started. Mm -hmm. So with that, how can we make sure that we're asking the right questions when we're going about creating these new visions of the future? I but, think one, go ahead. Oh. oh. By talking about it publicly, I think it's one of the problems of doing this kind of work in a big company because there's all kinds of reasons, from the SEC even, that you can't talk about stealth work because then the company is somewhat committing to do a product. And how can we fix? The reason I, le I, I left my cushy job at Facebook two and a half years ago to start my latest company and one of the reasons um, was it was a different thing I really wanted to do, but one of them was I felt that I had to be responsible and talk about it as it was being developed. And that is almost impossible to do at any big company. I've worked at three of them, Intel, Google, Facebook, but you name it, it's very difficult. So number one, talk about it, and that, that might mean in a startup or academia where you have the freedom to talk about it. Mm -hmm. So I think addressing built-in biases is very important with committees that review the data that you marshal for training machine learning, for example. But also, we need to make sure that other risks that are possible 
uh, have been thought about, like with self-driving cars. We need to test them extensively with over millions of miles. And any technology, whether it's a pharma technology or a nanotech technology, we really need to test them in uh, challenging environments. So we think about what the potential downside risks are proactively and try to guard against them. Mm -hmm. They won't catch everything, but it's a good start. What can some of those unintended consequences be, either in self-driving cars or there's many other examples that we can pull from? Well, I, I think like with self-driving cars, that's a, that is a good example. Like right now, what's the highway death toll? Something like 6,000 people a day. Too high. 6,000 people a day. So if we kill a few people a day with self-driving cars while we test them, is that cost too high? Right. Um, you almost can't deploy them fast enough, right? Every day you delay replacing cars with self-driving cars, your costs you 6,000 people a day because humans suck at driving. Mm -hmm. So the truth is, I think, I mean, there's, I think there's a hard limit on how good of a job we can do at anticipating all these unintended consequences and trying to regulate them into oblivion. I mean, the truth is, if we see a problem, that we experience, then we're usually pretty good at being able to figure out how to solve that. We've actually done a really good job of that with highway death tolls, but we got to the limit. Like we've made cars as safe as we can to handle humans being crappy drivers, and now we're at the limit. So, you know, what we need to do is go beyond that. And I think that that's the methodology that works. Find a problem that actually exists and go solve that instead of imagining problems and trying to solve them. Or just to add, you have the FDA in the U.S., which assures it takes four to five years longer to get a drug here, and it costs at least an order of magnitude more when it's already been deployed in Europe yeah. because of the regulation we put in place. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you know, I, I agree. we might want to rethink it. I think uh, we also need to recognize that when we deal with biology, we're dealing with Baroque systems that were not designed by linear human engineers. They have lots of complex feedback loops. And if we just spray toxic chemicals into the environment, or even pesticides in, into the environment that have uses, uses that are incredibly useful against malaria, for example, DDT, uh, we can end up having that in our body fat. We can end up having it all over the world, disrupting amphibians and bird eggs. So we want to do some proactive thinking about what could go wrong and some testing so that we don't make dumb mistakes that we've made before. Because so often when we're solving for X or we're trying to optimize for Y, we can very successfully do that. But it's the things that are being created on the outer edges of that that we're not expecting that we always have to try to control for. And there are ways that we can do that, but we need to have the right data to do it. Like this computational modeling we were speaking about before. Do you want to go into some of the work that well, you I think, do? Well, you know, that's a good example where, you know, the world's just different now. We were evolved to make decisions very emotionally. And um, that's worked for a while, but now we have something more powerful. We can collect data, we have sensors for that. We have networks to move the data to giant supercomputers where we can analyze it, and we can get better answers. But to do that, you have to convince yourself to believe those answers. Mm -hmm. And that's work, it's harder for humans, it doesn't come naturally. And that's the world that we live in now, is to build models. Models are like um, SimCity, you know? It literally is like SimCity. And we get to try thousands of possibilities to make the world behave the way we would prefer in software before we ever do it in the real world. And that's powerful. But it means that we got to decide what, again, like what are our values? What do we care about? What world do we want? And the computer can show us how to get there, but we have to get the data, we have to build the model, we have to infuse it with our values, and then we have to trust the answers. And, and that's a lot for, I think that's kind of like what we're going through as a society is how do you internalize those, those new superpowers. How do you code in values for things like gender diversity? Or, um... You tell the model, I would like to end up with 50-50 enrollment for males and females in STEM education. And it will tell you, here's how you get there, if that's your value, right? 
That's not hard to do. You just have to proactively choose what you care about. Um, mm -hmm. uh, in some of the ways, we've, uh, you've, you're doing this right now with uh, trying to eradicate malaria with your yeah, little so laser Yeah, so we've been for a decade, over a decade, we've been making giant computational models to help us figure out how to eradicate infectious disease and primarily malaria. And this isn't science fiction. We've been doing it for years. We're advising 75 different countries on how to optimally deploy their vaccination resources. This is how we're getting rid of polio once and for all. Again, <laughs> any day now. It, like, um, this is how we plan um, response to things like, like we had an Ebola outbreak. The first Ebola outbreak took 12,000 lives. We had one a couple months ago in, uh, I think it was, was it Congo? Um, 12 lives. And the reason is, we're, using computational models, we're able to plot ring vaccination campaigns that go in and stop it before it spreads. This is unprecedented for humans, a three order of magnitude improvement over a couple of years. That's amazing and powerful stuff. And we can do that for all kinds of problems. But, you know, we have to build those models and we have to understand them and trust them. But who gets to decide for how many human lives of self-driving cars we have to sacrifice before then? Like, is this something that should come down to the people who are making these models? Is it the CEOs of these companies? Is this something that like, happens in public discussion? Well, apparently, I mean, I, I'm going to shut up after this. <laughs> what I think is that we already waste too many lives on human drivers. So let's waste a few on self-driving cars and see if we can balance things. I literally think we have 7 billion people. We can spare a few to solve this problem proactively. And you're going to get paid back in lives, I promise. How do you two feel about that? I'm going to shut up now. Oh, I think clearly, 100%. It's, uh, it's, it's, do you want to live or die? It's pretty simple question. A lot of people do want to die. They could kill themselves that way and that maybe is, but like, honestly, like. That should be one like, of the modes for the self-driving car is like, I'm <laughs> done now. Suicide mode. Just <laughs> euthanasia. Don't kill anybody like, else. What, what do you call it? Ludicrous mode and then like euthanasia mode. It's <laughs> just like. Don't you know. think that's going to get past regulatory measures. But. A lot of this is about statistical illiteracy. So people have mm. baseline bias and they ignore the fact that we murder 1.2 million people around the world mm. every year. And if one or two people are killed by a self-driving car, they, the saliency bias takes over and they really go nuts. So we, one of the things we need to do is to help people address statistical illiteracy. That would help in a lot of different areas, including vaccinations. Mm -hmm. And how would you suggest addressing that? Well, we have the most powerful educational technology that humanity has ever developed. Video games. Be, it, video games and, oh. and all kinds of yeah. web-based <laughs> applications. So, I mean, we could do the job really well if we decided we wanted to do it. A lot of this is having the will to do it, and there is not uh, a consensus about what we want to do in our society. I actually think that's important, too, is that I don't really expect consensus, mm -hmm. right? Different jurisdictions have different values, different countries, different cultures, different people. And I think that's okay. We're not all gonna end up on the same page. I don't think I want the same values that a lot of people choose in other places. In fact, you guys probably don't agree with me about a bunch of stuff, which yeah, is fine. And I think that's, that's why we say, you know, like let's keep it free enough that people can all go try it and we can kind of compete on these value systems and see so what works. That's really worthwhile, but you want to make sure that if it's something like vaccinations, oh, yeah. and people are flying around the world, you have some consistency there. Otherwise, different rules will not help you. Excellent point. In terms of automotive, the focus is actually, for the whole market, the 100 million cars that ship a year, mm -hmm. it is on electrification, and that really does come from China because you really, can't drink the water or breathe the air. Mm. Mm -hmm. There's no discussion about the climate change. It's like, look, there's all these cars. Mm -hmm. It's 48 volt stop start, but that's that's the big effort on automotive mm. right now, in in all the on 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 every continent for that reason. With China as a big pusher for that, which is cool. Yeah, we're trying to save the world, not just America. <laughs> yeah. No, really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
But everyone has a different opinion of what save is. Oh. So, right. uh, Pablo, you said in your uh, talk yesterday that um, it's one thing to solve the problems that you have, but we should focus more on solving the problems that we don't have. Well, like, you know, you have like practice problems, right? Like learn to ship an app and get customers and support them and supply chain management. But then, you know, think of it as practice and take on a problem that you don't have, that a billion people have, like that's, that's more important. You'll feel better about doing it than selling enterprise software to rich people. It's also easier to get VC for it. Yeah, because, probably right. You know, like there's more money right now in venture capital than there has ever been mm -hmm. in the history of venture capital. And there's like something like one third of the companies starting now that there were four years ago. So you've never had an easier time getting money, but it has to be something that can impact the lives of billions of people with success. Yeah. So going for the big thing, not only is it more fun, it's going to be far more better funded. Right. And, um, and you're going to get a really cool team. And it's even easier to manage everybody because it's mission driven management. Everybody wants mm -hmm. to, you know, mm -hmm. save the world, however you define that for your company's mission. Mm -hmm. Right, so. and it's also important to do the math to make sure that whatever problem you're focusing on can scale and can really mm -hmm. be something more than a drop in the bucket of a huge global problem, but can really nail the problem mm -hmm. if yeah. you succeed. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, how does the mission drive into what the work that you're doing right now with open water? Oh, open water, totally different than what we're talking about. Um, I'm trying to transform um, healthcare and enable brain-computer communication and um, also at the same time address the number one most expensive health um, cost for every country in the world, which is uh, brain disease. And I'm doing this, I was, I was running advanced consumer electronics at Facebook until two and a half years ago and I noticed that the manufacturing process improvements that were going in, into the fabs of Asia, I'm a, I'm a chip designer, I ship a lot of consumer electronics, electronics, optics, stuff like that. Um, I realized that the trends in smartphones could enable uh, the, those, the factories that make those components could be used with custom components that we've designed to see in high resolution inside of our body and brain and read and write our bodies and brains. So that means um, communication without moving your mouth or typing on your fingers, communicating with thought alone, seeing a tumor when it's stage one, like um, um, looking at clogged arteries, internal bleeding, um, even, even um, you know, precision psychiatry. Right now, if you are depressed, you go to the shrink and they ask you, you know, did you gain weight? Are you sleeping? Are you, this is the test. That's the test for what kind of depression you have. When, if you can have an fMRI scan, you can see exactly what kind of depression you have. And you can see how the therapy could treat it. Well, does that drug work or not with this actual real diagnostic? So we're working on a lot of that stuff. We showed the technology uh, live on stage at TED this year, the big TED in Vancouver and um, developer kits next year. Mm -hmm. And what's really amazing, two and a half years ago, I hoped, it's really interesting um, having knowledge of what's going into um, next year's smartphones. I mean, there's laser arrays in them and camera chips uh, designed for the near infrared, which enable the technology that, that, um, to see inside of our bodies because our bodies are translucent to red and near infrared light. You know this if you've ever gone outside at night and cupped a, a flashlight around your hand. The red light goes through. It scatters it, and in fact, with this observation of Moore's Law's improvement, there's a discontinuity in the physics of Moore's Law as the pixel size approaches the wavelength of light. And so what we actually do is make a hologram of the scattering of your body and invert it so we can both read the state of your body and write it. So surgery without the knife, um, we can even write neurons. We can read neuron states and write neuron states as, as I showed live on stage at TED. So there's profound implications for it. So I think a lot of the gloom and doom that we heard in the previous sessions go away as we up the technology. That's like all old school stuff. So we have a chance to recreate the platform and do it better. But there's profound issues with uh, privacy as we go uh, through that barrier of um, that last bastion of privacy of what's going on in your head. And so I think it's inevitable. 
absolutely inevitable, which is th there's not just my technology, there's Elon Musk has a solution, there's some other companies working on it. We, there's four that are announced. There must be another dozen that are probably stealth. Mm -hmm. um, who knows what the Chinese are doing, et cetera, you know, the Russians, who whatever, pick your country. Um, <laughs> Boogeymen. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's, yeah. it's inevitable, it's gonna happen, and so how do, we, how do we deal with it? Because we could all say, as a result of the last hour and a half or so, boy, why don't we just stop technology and not <laughs> do it anymore? And <laughs> like, we, we know kind of what happens. And like, my question is, do we want to, as humanity, to understand how our brain works or not? We probably are going to say yes to that. It's the number one health expense. It's interesting as humanity to understand how our brains and other brains work. It's inevitable that we do this, and so we have to talk about it and figure out how to do it ethically. And so it's important that we can have that vision of what we want to achieve and it being um, positive, utopian, as long as we are keeping our eyes open to, and as those kinds of issues come up, address them in the moment, right. and be transparent yeah. about Like here's them. four questions. I have this ski hat, it's available, it's non-invasively reads my mind. Can the police make me wear it? Can the military make me wear it? Can my spouse make me wear it? Can I put it on my child? And I think the answer should be no to all those questions. And what we might need for the new technologies, CRISPR, many of the things, is, is a new universal declaration of, of human rights with the new technologies. But it's hard to imagine that's gonna happen in the US because there's only been like two scientists or engineers that reached cabinet level or above in the United States <laughs> in the entire history of the United States. You can double it if you count Ben Franklin and Thomas Jefferson, which I think should be able to honorary go into it, but that's four. I'll approve it. So how on earth do we do that from a government level? Indeed, and it's not just uh, the universal declaration of human rights that's going to protect rights. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to enforce it. Right. And that's a very big deal, maybe harder than writing the declaration. And the other thing is that even if the technologies are absolutely wonderful in terms of their potential applications, it's all about how they're used, mm -hmm. whether they're used ethically or not ethically. Mm -hmm. So we can't get around that problem. We're going to have to wield our technology with foresight and responsibility. Otherwise, we'll suffer the consequences. You know, it's, right. one, it's one thing to suggest, you know, we create some sort of nuclear non-proliferation agreement that everyone agrees to, but that's easy in one way because um, those kinds of weapons are very large and they require a lot of uranium and they are all those kind of factors. But when it comes to AI and, you know, trying to protect against, A, the different policies and uh, what is being programmed into them, but then also how those are then used in homes, like what you're saying, or used in the incarceration system. Um, I, uh, do any of you have solutions for how to go about it on that level? Uh, the technology we're making will only work consensually, mm -hmm. but I mentioned I shipped billions of dollars worth of consumer electronics, so I've had what they call the sincerest form of flattery happen to me many times, which is <laughs> emulation, I mean copying. And so um, what we're, which we're putting a lot, of, a lot of things in place to make it very hard to, but assume, you know, it's, it's an arms race, like, mm -hmm. not literally an arms race, it's, it gets, you know, it's like crypto wars, like gets better and people break it. So you have to assume that people will copy it and break it despite it. We've mm -hmm. got patents, we've got lots of things like that, but then, you know, what do, what do we do as humanity to, um, you know, do we teach people to meditate so that they can turn off their brain, for example? Mm -hmm. That works unless they're being tortured. But torture is illegal as it is. It still happens. And so, you know, what it, we're in conversation with all kinds of groups about, about how to do this responsibly from the beginning mm -hmm. and trying to bake it into our technology as we're developing it. That's what we think is the responsible thing to do. Mm -hmm. and, and something that also, by the way, makes the cost of an MRI cost less than a dollar. Full body, like which can have profound implications for lowering the cost of healthcare. Mm -hmm. And it is the same technology that enables us to read and write our mm -hmm. brains. Uh, Pablos, what are some of the things that you're having to reckon with with that kind of positive, negative, utopian, dystopian things Mostly some of the projects you're working on? I just feel like, um, you know, humans are good at doing things they've seen done before. Mm -hmm. When you're trying to do new things, you have to rely on that like storytelling narrative mechanism you have to be able to implant an idea in people's minds 
so that we have something to shoot for. Mm -hmm. And what's happening with AI is we've gotten way, we've made these very irresponsible and lazy logical leaps that like, you know, computers get faster on this exponential curve, at this point they'll be smarter than humans. Mm -hmm. Which is like saying, you know, cars get faster on this curve, at this <coughs> point you'll be able to drive to Australia. <laughs> no, there's not, there's no justification for that leap. I don't buy it, I don't believe it, and what we're doing is we're skipping it. I say, okay, just never mind that, and just say, okay, well, if we did get computers that were smarter than humans, then what? And it's a, it's a huge diversion, and what's happened is the then what has been, well, then we make movies about the way that robots turn us into their pets or paper clips. And so <laughs> there's this kind of, you know, noise floor of like, you know, poorly justified logical leaps and poorly informed perspectives on the future. And all we get are scary stories. And to combat that, what we need are positive, possibilist stories about how it could actually go better. Do you think the world could be awesome in the future? Is it a foregone conclusion that it's not gonna be? No. If there's any chance that it could be awesome, then we need a story about how it could be awesome. Mm -hmm. So we can go build it. We need that in our minds and we're not getting enough of that. And, we, and, and, that, and that to me is the biggest thing. Star Trek. Right I, I think Star Trek did a great job of it, but it's, Star Trek is 35 <laughs> years old, guys. What have we had since? Yeah. Do we have any Hollywood producers in the room that want to option Get this on panel it. for a film? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We've got one. <laughs> We've got one. <laughs> we'll talk to you after, sir. <laughs> uh, I think Neil. we need a balanced set of narratives. We need both. Visions of the future that we really want mm -hmm. and some understanding of what could go wrong. Mm -hmm. And we, need, we really need to be guided by both considerations. Well, here's what I think. If a guy shows up and tells you a scary story about how technology is going to ruin everything, and he does not also bring you a story about how technology can be awesome, then kick him out. Yeah. Like, yeah. shame those guys. That's right. irresponsible and lazy and they're cheating. Yeah, scary right. stories sell better. Get rid of those guys. Right. But Get the ones who bring balance. That's not what we're up to here, though. Oh, no. I mean, yeah. you we're hear a guys. lot of positive <laughs> stories here. It's the classic management technique. If you want me to come up with a negative story, then get me drunk. What's well, a classic? Um, uh, Less than an hour. Uh, we we will start to wrap up because we're also aware that we are standing between you guys and a beer. Um, but it's uh, being able to hold both the utopian and the dystopian vision in either hand is important because to wield one or the other is always irresponsible. And I think that it's important that we do tell both stories because if we don't have dystopian visions that we can say, well, if we don't want to get there, what can we do right now to prevent that from happening? Well, also, and then the utopian visions of, well, if we want to get there, what do we do now? Also, you can't stop it. I mean, okay, people tried to when Galileo said there were four moons of Jupiter. He actually did get permission from the Pope, but then the Pope died and then he had to rescind it, but that said there was another world. So you can shut that down for a while or the cultural revolution of China shut down education for a while or stem cell research under, was it Reagan or Bush? You can shut it down for a while, but once the truth is out there, people can, I mean, I guess you can burn the libraries in the dark ages, but it's going to happen. The technological march, ethicists call this the technological imperative. The question is, how do we deal with it? It's inevitable. You can slow it down a little bit, but you know, then, ooh, China, beat us or what, you know, there's all these stores beat us and like we could collaborate and go faster. But yes, there's, um, there's, there's um, a lot that to be done. So I've just talked about, for example, something some of you might find scary to share our minds with each other. But really, you know, you talked about the problems in the beginning. There's not one major problem, which is, you know, every problem could be described as communication. So what if we could actually understand people, each other, all of the imperfections of our brains, all the thoughts, I mean, boy, me too goes times a thousand X. If, you know, if, could you imagine HR if in a meeting of any eight people trying to go over <laughs> some resource and everybody's thoughts and feelings are there on the table for each to see. But you know, actually it's what's going on regardless. And so how do we actually deal with ourselves and put that AI layer on top of it so that we can act rationally if we choose to rather than purely emotionally because we make our worst decisions when we're the most emotionally stressed and so we could address these things. 
And so whatever vision of the future we either want to end up in or we don't want to end up in, it starts now, though. And reminding ourselves that, yes, we can future cast, and yes, we can talk about all these things that are going to happen in 2040, but we are the ones that actually will either make those happen or not make those right. happen, right? And Yeah, and often it's not gloom and doom or nirvana. It's trade-offs, and you have to mm -hmm. come to the adult conversation about how do you manage the technology. Mm -hmm. I think trade-offs here, self-driving cars, uh, is a good example of that. Sorry, guys. But uh, for the people who are going to have to die to, in order for us to be able to advance to somewhere else. But well, they're trade -offs far too what we have expensive to deal with. right now, so we don't have to worry. Yeah, I mean, that's does. the problem. Is this, they're too expensive for mere mortals to mm -hmm. um, afford. So rich people can have them. And so, unfortunately, we're going to have to end on a slightly more negative note than what we were uh, hoping to, but <laughs> we, 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 will, we will get there one day. Um, thank you guys for listening to this part of the track, and uh, we look forward to sharing a drink with you later on in the next part of the evening. Thank you. Thank you.